Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carmine Gibaldi. I'm a professor of management, uh, entrepreneurship, and organizational behavior at St. John's University. I'm also here with you today because I'm the president of the Alumni Council and a professor of social entrepreneurship at Teachers College, where I serve as an adjunct professor. Uh, it is my pleasure today to be here with Kareem Abul Naga, who is a, an alumnus of TC, and where we'll be exploring the sort of intersection, if you would, or crossroads of entrepreneurship, education, and social good. Kareem, Kareem, pardon me. Kareem is certainly the CEO, as we might know already by reading his bio, is the CEO of Practice Makes Perfect, uh, also known as PMP. It is a, I think, nonprofit organization. We're going to poke away at that and, and see what Kareem has to say. Uh, that partners with K through 12 schools uh, to help narrow the, the opportunity gap, which, again, he founded this organization, believe it or not, at the age of 18 years old. He's an author. He's a TED fellow, echoing green fellow. And in 2016, he was ranked in the top three most powerful young entrepreneurs under the age of 25 in the world. Today, he will, and I may as well also, be answering some questions which you all submitted. And also, we welcome your participation in the conversation, which you can do by using the chat feature. Kareem, first of all, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for taking the time out to kind of come back as an alum and uh, show that support to the TC sort of community. Uh, let me start by asking you maybe a question about you, I guess, Kareem Abul Naga, uh, the man kind of behind PMP and maybe other things that you've done as well. And tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe what has inspired you to, kind of, to launch PMP, as well as maybe in my own experiences in the social entrepreneurial world, was there some kind of life event, part of your past history that maybe created a bit of a passion in this particular space? So we'd love to hear that. And then we'll get to some more questions, of course. But again, welcome. Thank you, Carmine. I appreciate it. And obviously, always welcome the opportunity to get back and speak to my classmates um, in any venue that we have. So um, I know you said we're going to debate this later, but we're actually structured as a public benefit corporation. So when, right. when we started, we were a nonprofit and then in 2016 changed legal statuses. So happy to dive into that later as well. Yeah, sure. Please. Uh, grew up in Queens, actually. So not too far from St. John's, <laughs> I guess. Uh, okay. Born and raised through and through New Yorker all the way through from elementary school through college. Um, Moved around a lot as a kid, grew up mm -hmm. lower income, and I know my family was like dodging rent. So I think I moved like nine times between elementary school and my freshman year of high school. So yeah. lived in Woodside, Astoria, Long Island City, East Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, um, you name an area of Queens, and I've probably been through <laughs> it. So um, there was a life event. I believe it was my freshman year of college. I was getting ready to apply for a transfer opportunity to go from Baruch, where I did my freshman year, to Cornell. And in the process of applying, I was like, well, I'm going to have all of these like bills to pay. Let me start applying for scholarships. And that was 2010. At the mm -hmm. time, McKinsey had just published their report on the achievement gap and how it was impacting America's schools. And it said it was like $350 million a year in, in like economic lost opportunity. And that was all great. Um, for me, it was Coca-Cola saying, hey, we're going to give $10,000 to any student who comes up with a solution for the achievement gap that involves corporate intervention. Ah, was the challenge. <laughs> and I remember at the time, I was like, I didn't know what the hell the achievement gap was um, and had never worked in a corporation, neither had my parents, but I wanted $10,000 so I could get this scholarship to transfer to Cornell. And in the process then started to dig deeper and uncover a lot of the inequality, the inequity, the lack of opportunities, the disparities that were sort of so natural or normal for me as a kid, mm -hmm. right? When I woke up and went to school and my teacher wasn't there, I wasn't sitting there thinking about how I was getting robbed of my education. My friends sure. and I were running through the hallways, like we were so excited, it was like a free period all of a sudden, right? When we were sitting in study hall, um, we weren't thinking about the fact that the, the school didn't have enough teachers during that period. And so they needed to give us a gap, right? Mm -hmm. So they could fill it and use the teachers that they currently had. So 
um, it was a whole like shift. And a lot of the numbers and the things they were talking about in these reports weren't just numbers to me like they were to any other economist. Uh, these were real people, right? Sure. I went through the, these low-income public schools. I had 60 absences when I was in seventh grade because I wasn't engaged. My local high school had a 55% graduation rate. There were 4,400 kids there. My older brother and I were graduating high school the same year. These weren't just numbers. These, mm -hmm. these numbers were, were talking about me. And so yeah, I was, was just like some economist <laughs> going through it. And I think that was the beginning of the journey, you know, was the inspiration and uh, the fire, I guess, was lit within me to make sure that whatever existed for the last 50 or 60 years didn't continue again for the next 50 or 60 years. Oh, very interesting. So there was something. So obviously a lot, I shouldn't say just something, but a lot that occurred in your life that kind of led you to this. But obviously it shows something inside of you that was able to take on that challenge. So I love a competitive person that's in education. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it's actually interesting that you say that because I, I think so much of the challenges that we have in society are not because of this like systemic oppression. Right. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing people go to saying that, oh, there are, there's this whole society that's set up to keep people of color down, people who are poor down, people who are first generation down, black and Latino people down. And it took a little while after I graduated. I remember sitting in a conference and this guy who had been in the public school system for maybe 40 years gets up and like is talking to the entire crowd and says, guys, guess what? That term ESL that we've been using for decades, um, as everyone knows, stands for English as a second language is being changed and being replaced with this new term, um, ENL, English as a new language, because after years, we've realized that English is actually the third or fourth language for a lot of kids coming to our country. Sure. And everyone's yeah. like applauding, like, yeah, we made this like big discovery and realization. And I remember my jaw dropping. And I was like, are you guys effing kidding me? It mm -hmm. took you guys that long to figure out that for kids coming to our country, that it's their third or fourth language. And of course, sure. for the educators in the audience, you know, you would teach someone who's trilingual very differently than you would teach yep. someone who was bilingual or learning a second language. And so it was in that moment that I realized like, hey, everyone wakes up every single day with their own problems, right? Mm -hmm. We all have our own issues at home. We have our own issues at work. We have our own issues like everywhere else. But the last thing we're thinking about is the problems of other people. And so, right. so much or so little of the progress that's happening day to day is more so attributed to apathy than it is oppression. And I think yep. w when I had that realization was when I doubled down again and said, listen, I, my, my job and the work that we're doing isn't just about what we're doing day to day, but it's to inspire other people to action. Because when we care, when we pay attention, we can actually create change. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're glad you did. We're very happy yes. you did. So kind of taking this to some of the other questions, right? So you're an alum. You obviously went through TC. How did your time at TC? Now, you started out at 18 with PMP. How did your time at TC help you kind of move to the next phase or elevate or expand, scale, whatever word you want to plug in there? Sure. So, yeah, I, I went and started the master's program. I think I was at a, at a, at a juncture in our work. It was mm -hmm. 2017, I think I started the program. And at that point, we'd been a nonprofit for a few years. So we started in 2010. I graduated undergrad in 2013. So about yep. four years between then and then. And then in 2016, actually took the company from a 501c3 to a public benefit corporation. So it was in that year that I applied, thinking more about policy and the policy angle and how we could use policy to hopefully scale things. Um, what I instead got was a deep dive in education history. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, they always talk about how like, there's so little that you know, obviously, when you're going through it, but it was a very humbling experience to sit there and reflect on the history to see how many things have already been tried, right? right. Centralization, decentralization, centralization, decentralization, board, mm -hmm. mayoral control, board, mayoral control, going back and forth on that, school integration, desegregation, and then reintegration and desegregation again. And so um, having both the vantage point of being able to sit there, uh, talk to my peers, work with, our, uh, work with the professors, not only gave me a better understanding of how policy and compliance works at the state level, but our work during that time also introduced me to other alums and school principals who I was able to go deeper with on both our services and the work that we're doing. And so during that time period, we actually expanded from just summer to including school year. 
And mm-hmm. I know, I think at the time we entered the program, we were maybe working with 20 or 30 schools. And I know last school year we worked with 81. And so um, I, it was definitely a catapult in that journey, both giving me deeper insight into what was happening in the education system and in helping me build relationships with other alums and across the education sector. Great. Now, since you just uh, mentioned a couple of things there, uh, implications around moving from summer to all year long. Can you explain a little bit, I guess, to our audience, to people exactly what takes place? Was it a summer bridge program in a way at one point? How does it, how did it expand to all year long and exactly maybe what takes place? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the genesis of the work that we were doing was rooted in a lot of personal frustration. So you mm-hmm. learn about the achievement gap, you learn about the inequality. And I sat there and I remember thinking, well, like, there's everything in the world is like contributing to the achievement gap, right? Everything from a lack of positive role models to like poor health conditions in a lot of the neighborhoods that we live in. But I ran across a study that said two thirds of it was directly attributed to unequal summer learning opportunities. So we all were educators in the audience. We all know the summer learning loss and we all know the summer slide. Um, The one piece that's often left out of the equation is the compounding effect that results when kids return to school and we spend the first two months of the year reteaching old material. And Mm. who knows if this year we're actually going to get past teaching old material, given just how much of a regression there's been in the inconsistency we have in our schools right now. So Mm. it was never for me about summer. It was always about the achievement gap. Summer just happened to be the largest like root cause that was documented on paper. Um, And so we started there. We did that for years. Um, For a little while, I want to say like we pigeonholed ourselves into summer. But as Mm -hmm. we continued to build deeper relationships with our partners, we started to realize that the need was just as great during the year as it was during the summer. And actually, there was a larger appetite for services during the school year. So a large part behind why sometimes you don't have large summer programs or large after school programs existing in schools is because the school system expects the administrators to be on site when those programs are happening. So not only are you asking them to be there all day and you're giving them all of these different reporting requirements, but you're saying if you want to run any programming over the summer or on the weekends or after school, you or someone on your leadership team needs to be there. So you're asking the most tired people to to do even more work just by sitting in there. And sometimes the programming isn't happening, not because there's a lack of funding, but because of the structure that we've created inherently Mm -hmm. there. So um, through those partnerships and relationships, we had school leaders literally tell us, hey, if you all were running our school year programs, like you were running our summer programs, we would stay. But otherwise, absolutely not. Um, it's always difficult and continues to be challenging. And a lot of our teachers are also tired and burnt out. So we took that as an opportunity to experiment. We didn't just want to do after school. So we asked our schools what they needed. And actually, 80% of our programs during the school year are during the school day, where we're pushing into classrooms. We're creating opportunities for small group instruction. We're supporting with pullouts during prep periods. Um, We're targeting high need students and giving them additional remediation and support. So it runs the gamut. And then of course, we're doing the after school and doing the Saturdays, but there's a lot more continuity there. Because when you have folks who are in your school building who are there a couple days a week, who are able to work longer during those days, they're also more apt to want to stay longer. And so you have that consistency and and those relationships that transfer from the school day into the after school sessions. Great. Wonderful. You're doing wonderful work. Uh, So now how how many, if you would explain maybe to our audience, what sort of population of folks do you have working with you? Uh, And then we'll talk about maybe some of those partnerships a little bit also, but. Sure. I mean, I think it's important to just note that we work with low income schools and Title mm-hmm. I schools. And so it's challenging. It's hard. And I, I remind our staff that almost all the time that we didn't sign up for this work because we knew it would be easy. You know, we signed up for it because we knew it would be challenging. But of course, when you're dealing with those challenges day to day, you forget that. Um, so just reinforcing that bit. But all of our schools are low income, all children of color, all only in New York City. So we worked with 81 schools last year and touched every grade from kindergarten to 12th grade uh, built during the school year and over the summer Um, Mm -hmm. so that's that piece of it and then our our big core are our interventionists or our education champions um, as we're renaming them and they're college students and recent graduates a lot of them grew up in the communities that we're in so taking that same sort of perspective of hey I, i grew up in this neighborhood i understand the challenges that these children are going through 
and I'm in college, right? The goal for a lot of, for a lot of our children, we're saying is college or post-secondary success or some alternative there, but we're not bringing those role models while they're currently there to go back into schools. And so we're bridging that divide, bringing in people who look like the children who are working with them, who are a couple of steps ahead to inspire and motivate them. Right. So, so much of the change we're trying to create is going to be driven by people. And, and that's right. a big part of what we do. Sure. And the educational leaders in those schools you partner with, Absolutely. do they seek you out or do you seek them out? Uh, how does that partnership connection, how is that made? Yeah, it's a combination. So um, sometimes we're proactively reaching out because we identify a school that we know we can support. And mm -hmm. it's equally as many times a school leader or a school principal seeing a peer or a colleague struggling with something that they know we can help them with and they're making that introduction. Right, so you're, you're well kind of embedded in, I guess, the New York City Board of Education sort of. Yeah, we've worked with about right, 160 you're on their, you're on their schools site. in there. Okay. And then we'll probably support close to 130 this school year. Fantastic, wonderful, wonderful. So let's go back to the Public Benefits Corporation. Would you mind explaining to, again, our audience, we know that within the social entrepreneurial space, you can be, a lot of people don't understand it, they think it has to be nonprofit, something it's only for profit. We know there's a hybrid space in between, there are different legal models and so on. So would you be kind enough to explain some of that to us? Yeah, I mean, when, when I started out and what I'll sort of give everyone as guidance is that you need a legal structure that ultimately supports your mission, right? And when we were starting, we wanted to serve low-income kids and families. And the only way we could serve low-income kids and families at the time directly was to raise money from really rich people or people who were sympathetic to what was going on in our communities. And so the only way you can get money from people tax-free to then run programs for someone else is as a 501c3 or a nonprofit. A couple of years into it, realized that in order to serve low-income kids and families at scale, the only way to do that would be through school leaders or hospitals, right? Those are the only two areas in which our low-income communities are sort of organized in any like meaningful way. And so... Mm -hmm. We started targeting our services and targeting our messaging to school leaders. Um, what folks know here on the nonprofit side as well is your donors do have say in what you're doing, right? And for a little while when we were a nonprofit and we were starting out with summer, it was uh, mission drift if we tried to do something during the school year. So even though our school leaders were saying, hey, we want to do something during the school year, the appetite from the funders wasn't there because we were a summer only organization or we were supposed right. to be the summer solution. So that felt very limiting. Um, as we were exploring other ways to support schools, we started to realize that schools did have budget. They did have funding. They could use those funds to support students. It may not be a lot, but if they were very intentional and tactical with it, and we were helping them drive proficiency, so focus on the things that they're graded and rated on, um, that there would be an opportunity there to receive school budget funds, which would allow us to be more sustainable. Um, and in, in that case, we decided well, it doesn't make sense and we don't have to be a 501c3 to be able to support schools and work with them directly. And then, of course, there's the entire how the education system works, how you get contracts, what conferences you need to be in and overhead and all these other mm -hmm. things. So strategically, it made more sense for us to change our legal structure. Um, the public benefit corporation legal structure, as you were alluding to, is sort of in the middle, right? So right. traditional for-profit company, you have a fiduciary obligation to maximize shareholder profit. Mm -hmm. um, traditional public benefit corporation structure, your number one fiduciary obligation is to maximize public benefit. Your second fiduciary obligation is to maximize shareholder profit. And that's not to be underrated because in a traditional for-profit company, if you said, hey, I want to take 10% of the profits this year and increase our employee benefit contribution by 10%, you could actually be sued by your shareholders. In a public benefit corporation, you can take that and say, hey, we're taking all these profits and we're reinvesting them in our people because we believe this is what's going to do the most good this year. That's a defensible argument now in court and a shareholder can't sue you. Um, right. We're fortunate enough that we don't have any outside funding. Like we've been able to bootstrap and work directly with our school partners. And so our, our biggest risk is that too much power is concentrated in one individual. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we have a board, we have a leadership team, we have accountability um, and our public benefit certification status also comes with a biannual um, review. And so all of public benefit corporations that become certified B Corps are also scored 
every other year. And you can go on the bcorp.net website and see how companies are scoring on a governance standpoint, how they're treating their employees, um, what they're doing for their customers and stakeholders. And so it's a whole other layer of accountability that doesn't exist for a traditional for-profit company. Wonderful. So to, I guess, clarify that just a little bit more for our audience, does that mean that you're now supported by the Board of Ed or in working in conjunction with them? As you said, your partners. Yeah, so it's it's still a misunderstood bucket. Right. Um, so we'll banks talk. banks don't recognize public benefit corporations. And so yep. even though that's our legal governance structure, we wind up falling mm -hmm. in the bucket of, well, we're not a, a nonprofit because you don't get a tax exemption. So you're treated as a C-Corp or a for-profit. And right. so you don't, the DOE doesn't directly promote any organization that's not giving services away for free because it mm -hmm. it's perceived as a conflict of interest. Sure. And so DOE Central is not going out there promoting our services. No, but they're not out there saying don't work with them either. It's just sort of like you build your own relationships and you build your own partnerships. And I know to folks in the audience who might be thinking, well, I want to start a, a for-profit, but that sounds daunting, right? There's 1,700 schools. I'm not going to go school to school to find a partner. I'd rather be a nonprofit and have them promote my services. Well, the truth is, even when you're a nonprofit, you're one of thousands of nonprofits and they're not going to promote right. your services actively either. And so uh, there's fewer advantage there. And when they're assigning contracts, uh, it's less about your legal structure and more about your price and your impact. Right. So mm -hmm. whether you're a nonprofit or for profit, unless you're giving services away completely for free, which we've realized is not actually sustainable long term. Right. Because you're yep. you're dependent on whether or not someone is going to give you a donation. Um, we realized we have to charge schools. We have to work with schools in partnership. And that's the only way we're going to be able to create the long-term impacts that we want to see in our schools. Right. Great. Now, when you started, if I may just, you said you were a nonprofit and then you sort of alluded to before, which we all know that big donors like to have a little bit of say in things and uh, right. Sort of like a element of control. Did you have in your experience, any large donor maybe have a major impact? on even what you do today, sort of in your thinking and your approach? You don't have to name names or anything. I was just curious if some person also was influential that way. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely the positive influences like Echoing Green, um, mm -hmm. Bill Ackman through the Pershing Square Foundation, um, Andrew and Ann Tish, who like made really sure. transformative gifts in the early years. And mm -hmm. I know even the Sackler family, they're unpopular, but they started an incubator called vSpace, which like gave yep. us half a million dollars in in-kind support when we started out. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all like on the positive bucket, but then there were right. equally as many on the other side. I remember <laughs> a donor in particular, I won't name him, but he was like, listen, I Thank you. En enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> but um, my focus is on Washington, D.C., and right. so if you want to come out to Washington, D.C., then like we'll fund you. And I was still like really green is the, the term, mm -hmm. I guess, or naive, didn't yeah. know any better, um, was chasing the dollars and said, you know what, let's go and run a program in D.C. And this was summer of 2014. And so literally fourth year out, but really only my second year full time, still don't really know what I'm doing. We set up operations for the summer in D.C. and, and the program was a disaster. And I right. was on a, a red eye, like Amtrak back and forth every other day, literally between DC and New York City, because we committed to taking those funds because they would help us continue to grow, but it wasn't the right type of growth and we weren't ready for it as an organization. And so learned just as much from folks who um, sort of said, hey, these are where my dollars are going. And we jumped on them as I did from folks who were transformative and supportive in the work that we were doing in the very beginning. Right. Right. So when we're off air, you could tell me who it was. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, <got> you. <laughs> you know, and, and nothing like there's nothing wrong with and I don't think the person did that intentionally to, to sabotage us. No, of course not. It's just the, <laughs> the way the system works and the way the nonprofit model is designed where, you know, as an individual, I want to give to the areas that are near and dear to my heart. And sure. if I live in a certain neighborhood and I live in a certain area and someone's asking me for money, I say, hey, I want what you're doing to be here if you want this money. And it's just not as easy to say no on the other side when you're relying on that philanthropy to fund payroll and to yep. have a larger impact. No, no, without question, without question. So given all that you're talking about, nonprofit, for-profit, so on, given that you're uh, uh, involved and recognized by, by Ted and Forbes and so many others, how would you kind of look at yourself, define yourself, speak of yourself, business person, educator, some hybrid person in between, 
uh, do you see yourself as an educator? Do you see yourself as a business person? Oh, absolutely. And maybe are both skills needed? You know, yeah. Oh, I, I don't think you can run an education company without both skills, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely stronger on the, the business fundamentals and the technical side than I am on the curriculum side. But after mm -hmm. 12 years of just like being in schools, being around educators, being forced to kind of like learn on the fly, I wouldn't say like I have it down pat, but I, um, I know enough to be dangerous, I think is the, <laughs> is the, no, is the no, level sure. you want to get to. So, <laughs> um, definitely feel like I'd put myself in that bucket, but, um, for me, at the, end of, at the end of the day, it's about serving children, right? And sure. I know multiple times you said, like, I'm doing this or we're doing this. But the, the truth of the matter is that there are hundreds of people behind me who are, who are enabling our work every single day and an incredible leadership team that's really driving us forward. Right. And that's the thing about social entrepreneurship, right? It's, it is taking, and that's where some people can't wrap their heads around, it's sort of taking stuff from business, business model approaches, doing social good. Some people think they're almost in opposing issues where they're not. We certainly have learned that they're not and so on to your point. And I, I actually think the future of business is this like Venn diagram where we're at, right? In the middle where tr nonprofits have historically just solved social problems, right? Like poverty, hunger, um, achievement gaps, and for-profits have historically solved pain points, Right. Um, serving people food, giving them nicer clothes, giving them housing. And we know on one side, you're inspired and excited to wake up and go to work and show up every single day, but you don't get paid. And so you can't do it for a really long time. And on the other side, you get paid all the money in the world, but you feel like you have no meaning and you wake up empty every single day. And the, the middle is sort of where we're operating now, right? Which is the genesis of the two, which is waking up every single day to solve a social problem that also addresses a pain point. Right. And if we're able to do that, then we can achieve scale and do good and do well at the same time for folks, knowing that, yes, you're never going to get paid as much as you will in a for profit, but you'll make more than you will in a nonprofit. You'll never be as meaningful as you will in a nonprofit where you're only doing good. Right. It's like getting paid to give blood. You don't no one wants to get mm -hmm. paid to give blood. It actually devalues it. But you have enough money that you can sustain yourself and sustain the lifestyle that you want. Right. Good. And look, and certainly you're succeeding in both areas, bringing together all of that and doing a lot of good. So again, we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, so with all of that, with your success, with so much success in New York City schools, what's next well, in terms of how, how you see things going from practice to make perfect or beyond? even some other venture, whatever. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm squarely here for as, as long as the board doesn't fire me, right? <laughs> or or my, <laughs> my people don't want to kick me out. Um, but, but at the same time, I will say like, we had a very challenging moment in 28, early 2018, and I nearly drove the company into bankruptcy, you know? And so, and I, and I say I there because I, I made the series of success and mistakes that almost put us there. And up until that point in my life, I just sort of imagined that after I turned on my full-time offers, graduating from undergrad, that this was going to be it for me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment where you're about to lose everything, right, the things that are important really do come into focus. And for me, it was more about our mission and it was more about the children we were serving and the people who had gone through our programs before. And I made the commitment and the promise to myself that in the moment that I realized or other people around me realized that I'm no longer the best person to be doing my job, that I would step aside, right? right. Because it's not about me. And it's not about what we're doing. Um, but I, I will say, um, as I think about this, and I think about at least the next like 10, 20, or even 30 years, my, my lens and approach to change um, and that timetable has, changed, has also been altered, right? And one of the things that you learn when you go to TC and you study education history is that uh, real change, right? Like real sustainable change takes time. Right. It's not a couple of year thing. When, when you think about children going through our public school system from K to 12 or K through college, you're talking about an 18, 19 year like life cycle. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of the challenge with politics. Right. You have people coming in and out every four to eight years. Like kids have only been in school for half of that. So they get to eighth grade and then you change the entire system on them when someone new comes into power. And so I, I've taken the approach and I've, I've been in the camp that this is a 30, 40, 50 year thing. And thank God I started when I was 18 because if, if all goes as planned, right time is on my side. And 
when I think about what we're doing, it's about creating that movement, right? It's about inspiring a community. It's about moving people towards action, not just about the day-to-day tutoring and the mentoring that we're doing in our schools. And I'd, I'd love to be able to look back 30, 40 years from now and know that we built an institution that leveled the playing field for low-income children, right? It, mm-hmm. And, and that, that word institution is very intentional because institutions are stable, right? When you think about these large colleges and universities, they are institutions. They've been around for a really long time. They are valued, right? Or they create value. And so I don't ever want us to be anywhere where they're, yeah, they're, they're valuable and they create value. <laughs> I don't want us to be an organization or a company that anyone ever looks at and says it's not adding value where we are. And they have recurring patterns of behavior, right? And so we work in neighborhoods and we work in communities where things are unstable, they're unpredictable all the time. And we want to be that predictability, right? We want to create that stability. And so I see us as we're growing, continuing to go deeper, so expanding our product offerings. And I know for the last year and a half, we've been building software to help streamline data and reporting for our school leaders and also help them identify who their highest priority students are. And so we've been rolling that out. And we want to do a lot more on the curriculum side, just sitting through seminars at TC over the years and just recognizing like how much our student voice is like left out of the equation and making sure yeah. that our curriculum is timely and reflects what's going on in the world. Um, so thinking a lot more about that. And then, of course, we have the ability to go to other cities. Um, and that's also on our, on our, on our dream roadmap. So um, the vision is there. The excitement is there. The energy is there. We have the team of people. And it's just going to take time to get there. Um, we yeah. don't want to do one of these things where you compromise all of your people and you compromise your quality and all of that in the process. But at the same time, we recognize that there's urgency and we're continuing to push forward and do that. So as long as the board right. keeps me and as long as the team keeps me, I'll be here. Um, but if, if any of that changes, then we'll figure it out together. And maybe I'll, I'll well, be coming, we, we, coming to St. John's don't. to teach with you. <laughs> <laughs> we know they're lucky to have you. So you'll be there for a long time, I think. Uh, you see other, as you said, thinking about other uh, city school systems and so on, public school systems. Have any of them reached out to you? Just curious, you know, like Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, D.C., whomever. I'm thinking kind of, you know close proximity to New York? Yeah, no, I mean, we've gotten interest from a number of different school districts. Um, I don't want to put anyone out there, but I think we're at a point right now where we sort of told districts outside of New York City, like, we'll do work with you online this year. Um, So if there's anything online and if there's a deeper commitment to actually put dollars behind us going out there and putting boots on the ground and building a presence, like, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big lessons from our DC experience was unless we have some sort of local presence or local intel, like it just doesn't make sense to go into another area yet. And we're still, I'm I'm projecting we're going to get to 130 schools this year because we were in 80 last year. We're still only 10% of the New York City public school system. And so, so much more to do there. And then so much in our nearby cities and areas. So I could see a scenario where we go out there to another city sooner, but it, it would require substantial commitment from that local school district. Otherwise, uh, we're staying home for a little bit longer. Right. Now, let me ask you a question. I was just thinking about it. Um, the work that PMP does, is it uh, such where you could leave a school district or a particular school and people there could continue to do the work without PMP, sort of create a self-sufficient kind of uh, environment? Or is that not part of the model? Um- Fortunately, it's not part of the model and not part of what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, we are always thinking about capacity. I mean, I will say this, though, that a lot of the people we hire and who work with us then later on wind up being hired by the schools, right? So yeah, it's great. Yeah. you get this try it before you buy it model, but you also get to create realistic job previews for folks and exposing new people to our school systems and the schools and how they operate um, and being able to build those organic, authentic relationships, which creates better fit. Right. A lot of times you have teachers in schools who just like kind of fell there and they don't like the culture. They are not aligned with the values. And that's why they don't have a great experience. So we kind of push that aside. But we're always going in there. and We're trying to provide that boost. Um, and then we have products, too. Right. Like the software that we're building that you just there's nothing you can do about it. like we can put it in there and it'll stay there. But you need to continue to touch it up, continue to do new education and continue to add features and dimensions to it. So some of the stuff we just won't be able to build long term capacity with. Right, right. Okay, let me let me just ask you one more question. We're going to get some questions from alums, students, and so on. Uh, I guess what what advice would you offer as a TC alum to people that are tuned in now? Right, TC students, TC alum, TC faculty, who 
whomever uh, as to kind of what what did you not just learn, but what could they do to sort of, you know, how can they sort of move forward with, with ideas around education, social entrepreneurship, and so on? What so advice could you give them? You're saying specifically for those who want to be entrepreneurs or who want to start social enterprises, right? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe specifically within some educationally related right venue or space. Yeah. I mean, I think I benefited from a couple of things. <laughs> One, I was incredibly naive because I started when I was 18, right? And so there's so much of the world that you still don't know. And as you get older, you become a lot more realistic and you actually close yourself off to, to luck, chance, and opportunity in so many ways. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, I had this safety net, right? Where I was in college for a couple of years, just like figuring it out and testing, right? Getting feedback. You know, we were a summer only program, so it took a long time before we got feedback, right? It was once a year that you were kind of operating. Sure. Um, but I think those two things were incredible in, in my own development. And if I was going back in time and giving someone advice, I'd say start because you're never going to be ready, right? There's no magical moment when someone's going to come and like knock on your door and say, today's the day to go, right? So if mm -hmm. you believe you're passionate about something, you're invested in it, start. Don't give up what you're doing yet. Try and get some traction on the side while you're doing it. And then the, the second bit of advice that I would sort of give is like, um, when you feel like you have that fit um, and you've jumped and you're out there, then just like make sure that you're very clear on your why. Right. Because in those moments when like when I was saying like right nearing bankruptcy, I'm all in. I'm like losing money. I think I had like one point seven million dollars in debt to my name and I grew up in a low income household. I didn't I didn't have one point seven million dollars at home. So I don't even know how you get in that much debt without without collateral. <laughs> but I was there. Right. And, and you're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. And in that moment, you better have a, a really compelling why for yourself, because that's the only way you're going to push through that situation. And so make sure you have that clarity behind why you're doing what you're doing and continue to reflect on it and feel good about it because that's what's going to drive you on the good days and on the bad days. Perfect. So that, and the, so that ties in with like your social enterprise and most successful ones really being connected to the mission, right? Being driven by that kind of why that mission, who are we here to help? What are we trying to do? And so on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not yeah. about you. It's about the work and the closer you can get to that, the, the better off you're going to be. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Of course. And thanks for answering my question. So let me get to uh, some of the audience questions. Otherwise, you and I will just talk for the next few hours. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right. So let, let's bring in some other questions here. Uh, let's see. We might have gotten to this a little bit, but it says, what is next for you? Will you create another business? So are you thinking of kind of going beyond PMP maybe, or you, you're still focused on, as you said, 30, 40, 50 years sticking with PMP. Right? This is a, yeah. I mean, if, if we innovate or we create, it'll all be within PMP. So that, okay. that's where but, I think the opportunities are. Right. And so you don't see any other tangential kind of businesses, if I could use that word, that you could start and continue to run PMP, whether I, it's on a software side or whether it's somewhere else. No, I mean, I have, I have hobbies. Like I have an investment club that I'm a part of with a couple of friends, but that that's the extent of like anything I'm going to do outside of work. Like my wife and I enjoyed real estate stuff. So <laughs> she's really into that, but no, this is my, okay. This, just, this, just this is it. This is it for now. That, right. So I think I stepped on this question's toes here. This person's toes. Uh, let's see here. It says, can you speak more about the impact your organization has had on the children? Are they performing better in school? How do you measure that performance, I guess, and so on? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm writing my third book now, and hopefully it'll come out next year, trying, getting a publisher now. So, um, and I talk a lot about like how we evaluate impact. So in the, to answer that person's question, yes, but the most transformative impact for me is the qualitative stuff, right? When we've had a mentor go through our program or a scholar go through our program and they're graduating from Mill Middlebury College now or... They mm -hmm. got into Cornell and to Brown and they're graduating. And one of them is working at BlackRock where I turned on my full-time offer when I graduated. And so from a qualitative standpoint, we've transformed lives, right? And the number sure. of school leaders that come back to us and tell us they've hired someone who's worked with us, which has now created a job opportunity, another pathway, um, I can't count on two hands, right? And so, um, yes, from that standpoint. And then short term, I can tell you all of our programs have an impact, right? From pre-test to post-test. Um, just going through the mundane of like what they're doing. Um, yes. But 
Do I believe that, that that shows growth or that that's transformative at the end of the day? Do I believe in the tests? Absolutely not, right? And I don't think they're accurate predictors of anything. And one of the case studies I sort of go through is like preschool, right? In the Perry preschool example that we talk about when we're in school, right? They realized in the 1970s that getting a head start was good. They tested mm -hmm. the kids after they did that head start type program when they entered kindergarten. And then they saw that the kids who participated early could tell the difference between the shapes and colors and can count which was like a great sign. And so they said, let's create more preschool programs. And they started expanding them. And then they tested the kids again when they got to fifth grade and they noticed that there was no difference between the kids who went through this preschool or Head Start program and the kids who didn't. And so they pulled all of the funding back again because of those like four, four years of right. data, only to then come back 15 years after to see as adults that the kids who were in these like early Head Start or preschool programs were more likely to have graduated high school, less likely to have been incarcerated and, and, and were earning more money. And so does anyone really know the full impact of what they're doing in education on a year to year basis or on a week to week or month to month basis, which are the, the timetables a lot of foundations expect you to uh, measure your impact on? Mm -hmm. No. And anyone who tells you otherwise is, is talking BS, right? But do you believe in the inputs, right? Do you have high quality staff? Are you focused on recruiting people who are diverse and are representative of the students? Are, do you have rigorous training? Is the support timely and is it there? And how do you think about the inputs that you're putting in there that we know drive success and actually lead to better outcomes? And that's where we right. spend a lot of our time, right? It's, it's on improving the inputs and not so much on the outputs because we know if we perfect the inputs, the outputs will follow. Right. Yep. And, I, yep. and I believe 10, 15, 20 years from now, like the impact will continue to, to be amplified and even ex exponentially grow. Yep. And look, and that's the, I assume, right, that's the frustrating part when sort of the folks giving you the money then expect that quantitative results. So now show us the, show us the numbers to support why we should give you more money since we gave you money last year. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, you, you, know, you know it. And, and, and I think it's one yeah. of the other frustrations and why it's difficult to scale an education when you go the nonprofit yep. route. Yep. Sure. Well, thank you. Let's see what the next question is. Uh, well, I think you might have gotten to this as well, too. But did you bring in partners to help you see your vision through? So I guess, did you do this at 18 on your own? Did you add partners to it when you were 22, 23, 24 as you kind of moved along? Yeah, I mean, this is not a one man show or a one man right. effort in any way, shape or form. And actually, one of the, the pieces of advice I give folks when they're starting on early is have a really big vision. Because the, the bigger your vision, the, the easier it is to see that you can't do it by yourself, right? And that is what inspires other people to collectively want to get involved, because they want to do good, they want to improve the world. Um, they want to work on something big, they want to work on something meaningful, they want to work on something that's going to change lives. And so I remember at Cornell, one of the first things I had with, with my vision was I, I pitched it to 200 different people. And it was in casual conversations where people would say like, hey, how, you're, how, how are you? How are you doing? And, <laughs> you know, 95% of the time people expect like a quick response, like, oh, everything yeah, is fine. okay. And I, <laughs> I took those opportunities to say like, I'm great, but I want to tell you about this idea. And then from that, I found five people who not only uh, listened, but they then followed up and said, hey, how's that thing that you're talking about? before I even got it off the ground. And so I brought five friends together at Cornell um, in a room and we said, hey, we're gonna do this. We got everything started together. When we graduated, they all went and took full-time jobs in other places. And that's when I learned about my risk tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, turned down my full-time job offers to do this and no guarantee or no money in the bank. Yeah. But um, so learned about that. And then as we've continued to grow, like our team now, we have over 200 um, part-time employees and a core team that's, just over 30 full-time employees. So, um, and then an amazing board of, of directors and support there. So I, I, and then even when we were a nonprofit, right. Thousands of donors, right. So thousands of individuals who heard our story, who committed to what we were doing. And, and, and that's the only way you, you can accomplish anything, right. It's right. bringing other people along with you, recognizing the problem is much bigger than the one you can solve um, and doing it together and being okay, sharing the credit. Right. So, Sure. I think that's the, the, the other bigger piece of it all, too. Right. Now, not to imply that you might have any weaknesses, but uh, <laughs> all when you think place. about the partners that you brought in, did was there the notion of, you know, what might I not be so good at and who could I use skill set wise, education wise, experience wise? Uh, absolutely. And I mean, even starting out right I, I studied hotel management in undergrad. So 
even though I did all of my outside research in class on the achievement gap and the disparities in education, I wasn't a teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked for that early on. I think that the bigger challenge is not knowing what you're really not good at, right? Or right. when the things you are good at, you're good at at a certain level, but you're at a new, you're operating at a new level. And, and those things that were strengths before are no longer really strengths, right? Sure. So I thought I knew business and I understood business, right? I, hotel management was essentially a business degree. And mm -hmm. I did my internships at Goldman Sachs and BlackRock. And so I had a theoretical understanding of business and how business operated. Um, but fast forward a few years later, I was like experience, I was like near bankruptcy, right? So you told me you were good at business, but you nearly bankrupt the company. Now, in that yeah. moment is when I really learned business, right? With the turnaround and everything else after. But I almost thought that I was really good in this one area and didn't even think to cover that weakness with someone who had a lot more experience. Um, yeah. But, but that, that's, I'm consistently doing that, trying to find out what those gaps are, where those areas are that I'm good and finding people who are even better. And what are the areas that I'm not good at and finding people sooner who are actually good in those areas? Sure. Okay, good. Appreciate that. Of course. Uh, let's see. There's another question from someone in the audience. What were the obstacles you faced in creating your business? Oh, I assume man. man. I assume there were many. <laughs> at what so stage? we might have enough time. In the, in the beginning, in the middle. <laughs> right. um, I mean, in the beginning, you're, you're struggling to get people to want to help you out, right? You have no money, you have no resources, and you have no track record. So how do you inspire people to want to donate their time or to volunteer with you? Um, right. And so I, I remember leaning in a lot on like my personality and my hobbies and like trying to create space around shared interests. Um, and then it transitioned from that to taking anyone who is willing to help and like thanking them profusely. Right. So a lot of times we get angry. We get someone who signs up to volunteer and then they don't show up. Well, there are people who did show up and we focus our energy and time sometimes on the people who didn't that wasted mm -hmm. energy, focus on the people who did come, continue to thank them, give them more responsibility and encourage them. Um, and then it's getting money, right? Then you have that next phase of how do I get money? And when we were a nonprofit, I remember thinking, well, I need to just ask all my friends. And so I asked all my friends for five, 10, 15, $20 donations. And it hurts, man, when your friends ignore your message or you could see they read it or they don't donate right. or whatever it is. But um, you kind of have to build that, that thick skin and that layer to go out there and you have to continue to ask because no one's just going to give you resources without knowing that you need them. So right. we did that periodically and, and that actually snowballed and led to other opportunities. And I think it was just as much marketing as it was fundraising. So I'd say th those were the biggest challenges in the earlier days. And of course, as you continue to grow, there'll always be problems, but um, they say entrepreneurs, right? Or even social entrepreneurs are people who like to solve problems, right? So you're, you're yeah. inherently a problem solver. Um, and that's what you're signing up for when you sign up to lead an organization. Right. And some are comfortable with risk taking, which you alluded so, to some, before. Some are comfortable with risk taking. <laughs> and that varies from person to person, as we know. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's see another question. Again, uh, might have gotten to this a little bit before. What's the key? piece of advice you'd give students hoping to enter social entrepreneurship space without having maybe to tying into this last obstacle without having any experience and that's sort of the big issue right people lacking experience lacking experience in this particular small world in a way um yeah and i mean truthfully okay. like you're you're trying to jump into an area that's new and i i think that's great i wish the the one piece of advice that someone would have given me a um earlier in my journey was to like really be honest with myself about what my wants and needs are. So for a lot of my peers who started with me in like in an echoing green fellowship or a global good fund fellowship, who I've seen who would today be seasoned social entrepreneurs have left mm -hmm. the field. And a lot of them leave the field because they weren't realistic about their own subconscious wants and needs. And I, I was fortunate enough to not have someone in the very, very like beginning when I was starting, but just a couple of years into my work, who challenged me and asked me questions that I didn't know I had answers to. Things like, how many kids do you want to have? And I was like, I don't know, three. Um, do you want to send your kids to public school or private school? And I remember at the time I said, private school, because I went to the public school system. I wouldn't put my kids <laughs> through that. How often do you want to take a vacation when you're older? I was like, I don't know, at least once a year. Um, do you want to bring your kids or do you want to go alone? I was like, I absolutely bring my kids. Um, what kind of neighborhood or environment do you want to raise your kids in? A middle class, an affluent, a rich? I was like, I don't know, upper middle class. Um, when you retire, how much money do you want to have? 
was like, I don't know, maybe 150 or $200,000 a year. So I could <laughs> travel the world and like go to all these places. And he's like, well, have you done the math on those things? And I was like, no, I, mean, <laughs> I think I was yeah. 22, 23. And he was like, well, you should do the math on those things. And I sat there and I started doing the math. And I was like, well, to get $200,000 a year, I need to have $5 million safe for retirement. Um, to be able to go on a trip every single year as an entire family, right, of five. And if I was paying for that in some modest, like, comfort, you're talking about $5,000 a year. Um, to buy a house in an upper middle class neighborhood in New York, you're talking about almost a million dollars spend. Send your kids to private school instead of public school, that's $50,000 a year. So I sat there and I thought about those things and I was like, I get it. I understand why so many of my friends have left the space. Because they yep. start out doing this work that's really important and really meaningful. But the truth is that meaningful work is not going to pay off in the beginning, right? You're not going to be getting the checks that, that are going to allow you to save all of this money later on. And so you have two things that you can do, right? You can sit there and say, these subconscious wants that I've had my entire life, they're not as important. I don't need to raise my kids upper middle class. I can raise them middle class. I don't need to take a vacation once a year. I can take a vacation once every other year. I don't need a fancy um, private school for my children. I can live in a good school district or be more involved as a parent to make sure they go to good schools. Um, I don't need $200,000 for retirement, right? Like that may be a dream stretch thing. If I marry rich, that's great. But if I don't, like <laughs> maybe I can get by with 50,000 or 80,000 and a pension or something. And so you have to either change your subconscious wants or you need to not start that work in the beginning and sit on the board of a nonprofit and write a check instead and go and chase the money that you need to be able to live out your own wants because it's very hard to go back into your work now that you see every single day and be satisfied when you had this image for what kind of lifestyle you were going to provide for your kids and your family and you're going to do this work every single day and that work doesn't provide for them. And so what tends to happen then is you start to resent the work, but the work hasn't changed right? It was right. your own subconscious wants that you never processed or dealt with that are infl influencing and impacting your ability to do your work. So I, I, I always like, I, and I think about that, I wish more social entrepreneurs had that opportunity to sit there and really reflect on what it is they wanted in their lives before they started. Because you can't have both of those things simultaneously in the beginning. It's just not possible. Sure. Well, great answer. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I just thought of something as, as, uh, your own observation, because I have my own sort of thought on this, but do you see sort of like millennials, even sort of Gen Z folks or whatever, being much more attracted to the social good component? Or is it just something I'm thinking about? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, do you see more people of a certain generation being drawn to wanting to, you know, make a profit, make some money, but also have... A social good component attached to it yeah just, i mean, just I, curious i, I see it in, in our space. workplace i saw it in our, our workplace before that even as i was like getting into the the heat or like the heart of my studies at cornell like they were starting social entrepreneurship um departments and they were offering more courses in it and, and that didn't just start because someone said hey this is a good idea there was demand from students saying hey business is great or finance is great but how do we use these tools to, to do something positive, right? And that was the microfinance revolution. And then from there saying, hey, there, there's more here. How do we study this? How do we use the tools that come from business to actually do good, to heal the world, to create sustainable living and sustainable environments for folks? So I, I definitely see that. Um, I'm not the typical millennial, though, in that I didn't bounce through like four or five different places, right? I've been at the same yeah. place for the last 12 years now. Um, so I can't speak to all of the generalizations, but I, I definitely see the the twist and the the desire for impact. Yeah. So I was looking at just that particular component, the, the social kind of good component, if you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, for sure. Anything else you'd like to share with us that maybe wasn't covered so far? I'm looking at the questions. Uh, yeah. I mean, here's one more. And maybe it was touched upon as well with some of my questions, but how much should one share their personal journey in the narrative of their storytelling within their brand of uh, on social media? Mm. I guess in communicating, how much do you talk about your yourself, your story? Yeah, I mean, it's it depends on where your organization is and, and what phase. In the very beginning, that's all you have your, to hang your hat on, right? Like there's no right. other reason why people are going to work with you other than they find something in your narrative or in your personal story that they connect to. Um, 
if you're not consistently fundraising or you don't have a very compelling story that inspires people to donate or fundraise, then you stop, right? Then you focus on your work. If you feel like it's going to continue to inspire people to want to get involved, then you keep sharing it. And then as, it, as your work continues to evolve and grow, then you think about the impact of other people and the lives that you're changing and what you're doing in their lives instead of what's going on in yours. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a constant reminder and a, and a constant opportunity to share with your, your staff, with your partners, like why you're doing this work, because they want to know that there's authenticity there. And so much of what we're doing is rooted in our own personal narratives. Um, I will answer the, the, like, the closing thought because I feel like we missed the big elephant in the room, which is COVID, right? And yep. um, it feels like it's gone to some people, but to others it's not because we've sort of been living with it for so long now that we're becoming numb to it. But um, it's, it's challenging in our schools. And the challenges are not getting any easier. And I, I hate to say it, but I feel like this year is going to be our transition year, right? I, I was meeting with school sure. leaders all last weekend, and they're all in a, in a lot of our low-income schools, they're dealing with the same problems. They wake up in the morning, and there's vacancies or there's call-outs. And they're not going through the day, and that's the first fire they have to put out. And they're dealing with families, and they're dealing with children, they're dealing with COVID cases still. And so instruction is not happening consistently for a lot of our children. Right. So we're envisioning that now kids are back in school with masks, but everything is fine. And the truth is, it's not fine yet. Um, and we're not out of the woods yet. And our teachers are pouring from empty cups and our school leaders are pouring from empty cups because this has been incredibly draining and taxing on them um, because they've been at the forefront of all of it. Right. In this pandemic, they were our essential workers, except they got no break. And I, I don't see a plan yet for any sort of comprehensive leave or support this upcoming summer. In fact, what I think is going to happen is there's going to be more pressure at the state and the federal level to do more during the summer because we missed an opportunity last year. We know instruction was inconsistent this year, but we can't continue down this like cycle where people have nothing to pour into. And I, and right. I do believe our, we do need some sort of comprehensive plan that, that starts to put the people who are at, at the forefront of this change and this delivery um, in the conversation and really thinking sure. about how, how do we help build them up how do we refill their glasses? How do we think about the profession? So that way when they come back next school year, having 10 solid months is going to be a lot more meaningful than trying to push through the summer where people are burned out and tired and then coming back into a school system with, with nothing again um, and running on empty for another year. So sure. I think that was that, 20. Yeah, that's the challenge for the folks in the audience. Figure that piece out. <laughs> yeah, it was 2020 a lost year. I don't want to say it was a lost year because I think in we church. learned so much from it. And right. I think it was a case for why we need a more flexible curriculum and why we need to evaluate children on so much more than just what they're learning in the classroom. Sure. I think it was one of the biggest tests in resiliency that we're ever going to experience in our lifetime, right? So if you can get through these, these next, this last year and this upcoming year and then even get into next year and quote unquote make it, get to high school, get to that next level, get to college or start a job, like that that speaks a lot to your resilience there are so many people who have just like lost hope or have stopped or don't see it as an achievement um but there was a lot of learning that was done this last year it just wasn't sure. in the traditional sense and so n going into next year when we're starting to evaluate gaps and deficiencies what they actually learned is not going to pop up anywhere because we don't right. evaluate them on those things but it wasn't a lost year there was a lot of learning it just wasn't the traditional learning that we're used to measuring for sure well Kareem, thank you so much. I mean, we're, we're very proud of you as a TC thank alum. We know you. things are going to be better off, to continue to be better off, I should say, because you're out there doing what you do. Uh, and I look, look forward to having maybe future conversations with you. Thank you, Kamran. Okay. I, so I appreciate wish you. Much you good and, luck. and so much of what our classmates are doing day in and day out and, and the incredible team that we have and just the children who continue to be resilient and show up every single day. So yeah. uh, pleasure is all mine. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.